let's see. A couple items on the agenda. Uh, is there anybody that would like to add something to the agenda? And I, uh, excuse me, I'm switching back and forth from the notes to the Zoom. So anybody like to add something to the, the agenda today? Okay. Then let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's see. The examples just disappeared. Do we have any demos today? I'm sorry, Matt, did you have something for a demo? No. Okay. Well, this might be the easiest moderating job ever because it looks like there's <laughs> nothing to go over. No topics, no demos. Um, okay, the folks from Nori are saying that they might have a demo for us next week. And I know they've been working uh, closely or uh, they've been using IPFS in their um, workflow and so forth and incorporating IPFS. Um, let's see. And they do have some questions. I'm seeing this in the chat uh, regarding RTFM, which I'm not familiar with. Um, so is everybody okay if we just let them ask those questions right now? Okay. Okay, yeah, so Paul, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask uh, the questions that you have. Pending. Yeah, so... Um I've got some questions, which uh, you guys can just tell me to go read the manual. Um, one of them is about uh, IPLD um, and how far along that project is. Um, and then the other one is about, uh, what is it called, CBOR versus the protocol buffer thing. What do people, where, where, where is that? What, what do people think about those? Which one should I Paul? try to use first? Paul, do you mind introducing yourself for those that might not uh, know who you are and what you're working on? Um, I th assuming there's nobody new here from last week, which there might be, um, people should know me. But if you don't, um, I'm working on this project called Nori where we're trying to uh, create a marketplace for the exchange of carbon removal credits. Um, and we want to make it as decentralized as possible to uh, create trust or platform for trust uh, across buyers and sellers of these assets. Um, and so IPFS is very interesting to us because of the possibility of um, distributing public data in a way that is decentralized. Thank you. Uh, I can try to take a, a stab at answering those questions. Um, and given that I've been reading the issues that uh, Paul has been opening and the emails with other questions, I'll, I'm going to try to be like specifically answering like your questions, given that I have all these other contacts. But like if someone else like is not following, uh, feel free to like raise your hand and stop me and ask for more context. And so um, IPLD is many things. Uh, one way to describe IPLD is it is a canonical way to reference hash link data. And so anything that you today have access through an hash can be a Git block, a Git object, can be a Bitcoin block, a torrent file, an IPFS file, etc., can be described by an IPLD link. And an IPLD link is a content identifier. So the term CID uh, appears a lot of times when talking about IPLD. When, um, when we use IPLD on IPFS, uh, or we can use IPLD on IPFS through the DAG API. So if you do IPFS uh, space DAG, or if you are using just IPFS, IPFS uh, call dot DAG, uh, you will get two uh, function calls, get and put. Uh, put you can put DAG nodes. You can even like just drop some blob of JSON. My kit will add it to IPFS and it will ash it, and it will give you the the CID for that blob of JSON. If you do get, you can do two things. You can just get a CID, 
So a content identifier and you will get the node back or you can do uh, a CID plus a path. So if you have an object with like a property name, you can do CID slash name. And now instead of like reading the, the object, you just read the property um, that uh, is on the object itself. And so if that property that you have in that object is actually a link to some other object, you get this really nice feature where you can do like, CID slash A slash B slash C and some of those uh, like paths are actually links to other nodes and those nodes can be again can be a Bitcoin block can be an Ethereum block can be a Torrent file and IPFS we will be able to use the IPLD resolver to traverse to those multiple formats and, and find the data that you are actually looking for without um, without having to stop at any part of the, the resolving because it is a different format or because uh, the data structures are not interoperable. Like it, 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 that's what it is solving at the first layer. Um, the, well, can I stop you for one second and ask some yeah. questions? Um, so I read a, a bunch about CIDs and um, yeah. it seems like you can use all kinds of different hashes, but uh, what, what hash is IPFS using by default? So that, the answer to that is SHA-256 for everything that is IPFS files. Uh, uh, but that doesn't mean that like if we are like fetching Ethereum blocks that we are going to use the same hash. We, we understand like that there is a different hash on the CID and we use that to check uh, the integrity of the block. And so expanding a little bit more on that and on your previous question about like what is Cibor, what is Perobuff, uh, we have two formats uh, called DAG for above and DAG CBOR. And DAG for above is like the, not necessarily legacy, but it was like the first format that IPFS supported, uh, often named or often called the Merkle DAG. And the Merkle DAG format is a protobuf that has a schema that says that there's a data field and a links field. And the links are like pointers to other DAG nodes. And so you can create these graph data structures where you bring a file into IPFS, you break the file into pieces, and then you build a DAG that represents the file. And the DAG is always built by like these links pointing to other nodes that point to other nodes then eventually add the data of the file. Um, and, and that is like what you get, like the data structure that you get when you use like IPFS add. Today, we have a new format that comes with IPFS called DAG Cibor. And it is essentially the same thing, like you can construct the same DAG with Exibor, but it has uh, other properties. For example, it doesn't require you to have a schema. So if you wanted to represent a file on IPFS with some other structure, you are not forced to like use the data field and the links field. You can have your own names, you can have your own metadata, you can have whatever you want. Because in the end, it is like a JSON, object and, and, and you are the one like describing how it gets represented. Uh, it also has one, again, it, it is a DAG CBOR, but it has one-to-one -one mapping with JSON. So you can use JSON. So I imagine, yep. I imagine that uh, CBOR is this specific specification and then protobuf is like Google's protocol buffer format. Yeah. Uh, and I imagine they have similar uh, characteristics in terms of um, efficiency and encoding and things like that? Not necessarily. Like um, there are some things where Perbuff excels better than Cibor, but like Cibor is more flexible. Uh, just because again, one-to-one -one mapping to JSON, it's really good for anything that you do on the web. And like web developers love tinkering with JSON, but for IPFS, it works really well because we can serialize that JSON into a thing that is binary packed. And, and we can use that binary packed format to move the, the nodes around and to, to make sure that we always hash to the same value. So Wyatt, I see your hand up. You want to add something or ask something? Yeah, so you've just been talking about the distinction between CBOR and DAG CBOR. I'm wondering if you could say how DAG CBOR relates to IPLD. Yeah, so good question. Um, the, um, Seabor is frozen by your question. <laughs> Am I frozen still? You're back now. Okay. <laughs> um, so Seabor is the serialization format. When we have the IPLV format back Seabor, we are already like making some decisions. For example, um, 
we are saying, hey, like you can add JSON to this thing and we'll do the serialization for you. Um, we are not going to insert another schema because Cibor also supports for schemas if you want, but like we, we don't like pick any specific schema for the, the, the serialization. And so uh, essentially we don't mess with your data. Um, by adding specific, uh, am I still frozen? Like it seems like everyone is frozen now. Oh my God. All right, am I back? Why is my internet so bad today? He's back, I think you're rebooting. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know why my internet failed. Um, I have no idea what you guys have heard so far because I just continued talking and then I realized yeah. everyone is frozen. <laughs> okay, my internet connection is stable. It doesn't make any sense because supposed to work very well. What about now? Okay. All right. Okay. Now I'm hearing. Okay. Yeah, someone... okay. Uh, so I was talking about IPLV and the question was Cibor versus Dark Cibor. And I don't know what you guys have heard from my explanation. Nothing. Heard nothing about it. Okay. 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 Uh, so from the start, Cibor is just like a, a binary packed format to represent JSON. Uh, it actually stands for concise binary object representation. And we, when we have the DAC Cibor format for IPLV, we are already making some decisions of how that format should be used. For example, we decide not to use any specific schema. And so when we grab a blob of JSON, it gets serialized to the default schema that Cibor uses. Uh, essentially it means like we don't mess with your data. So if you grab two blobs of JSON into different IP, uh, IPFS nodes and add them, they will always result into the same uh, CID. We, like we, we don't have any specific metadata to it. Uh, it also enables us to, to create a plugin for IPLV so that you can, uh, Okay, sorry, I was just paying it a to chat. Um, let me know if you have any questions, just raise your hand. So it enables us to have a plugin that we add to the IPLV resolver, and that teaches the IPLV resolver to be able to traverse through these uh, Seaboard nodes. And so the, the way that it works, that, that path notation that I was explaining before, where you do like the A slash B and slash C and so on, is provided by the DAC Seaboard format, and it's an IPLD format that gets plugged in into the IPLD resolver. And, and, and I'm, I know I'm saying like a lot of times IPLD resolve, like IPLD resolver and formats. And, and if, if you are mixing all of them, let me know so that I maybe try to start from, this, from the top. Um, but yeah, you have this resolver thing, you plug in all these formats and suddenly this resolver gets like a, uh, the ability to resolve through that specific format. And so you can do this for, again, for Bitcoin, for Ethereum, for DAX, Ebor, for DAX, for above, and you can create tomorrow uh, a DAX message pack. You can create tomorrow your own format, right? You can, you can have polls, serialization, binary packs, whatever. Uh, and, and you can add it to IPFS. And so IPFS then will know, um, how to traverse that format as well. So that if someone does a query, uh, a, a fetch for something that is inside the data structure, it can indeed like fetch some key that is on that data structure. Wyatt, I see that you had a, a question or a comment. Go ahead. I, I think the lead answer to it, I guess I had a follow up though from what he was just saying. So mm -hmm. you're saying you can, so I guess just to clarify, DAG Seabor is an IPLD format. Yes. Okay. Awesome. And yeah. so you're saying that you can register different uh, formats with an IPLD resolver so that you yeah. can understand this data like with an IPFS node. Exactly. Okay. Thanks. Exactly. Exactly. That's it. And, and yeah, we, if you go to the IPLD org and if you like search for JS dash IPLD dash any of those formats, you will find like 
a module for each of the formats, which is essentially the plugin that I was describing that then attaches to the main resolver. And, and there has always, like all of them have the same API. So basically they are just teaching IPLD to traverse into that format. So I saw one more hand, but now I don't see it anymore. Uh, Rob? Um, I just, this generated a question for me, which is on Friday, I was chatting with Lars about um, the fact that, and this sounds maybe similar, um, in like lib, lib P2P, depending on your implementation, if you don't have all the same transports in your implementation um, that another node might, you might not be able to actually communicate with all the nodes out there because they might not all speak the same set of transports. Um, is this sort of a, is it, does it make sense or is it correct to think of it similarly um, for things like DAG, Seabor, or other ways of serializing all these IPLD links that if your implementation that you're running on your node or whatever in your software doesn't understand that serialization or have that plug-in, like have the DAG Seaboard plug-in, you yeah. won't be able to necessarily traverse those links and understand that hash. So that, yeah, that, there is 100% correct. Uh, it is a similar thing that happens. Um, the, the difference is when we are on IPLD land, so networking land, it means like we don't even get to talk with the node because if we don't support the same transport, although you can do relay. And, and so, for example, from browser to a desktop node, you can have a relay node that talks both and then like access a bridge. For IPLD, because you are the one fetching the data, and so like you are resolving it locally. Like right now, the way that IPLD works, and and, and by the way, this is like IPLD level one. Uh, there's like two more levels that then offer other features, but let's like just make sure that the level one is really solid in everyone's minds. Um, and so, because you are the one fetching, you at least still get the data. And because the links it's themselves have the multi codec so the type of the data, you know that like you either know that you have the resolver or you don't have the resolver. And so if you don't have the resolver, now you are empowered with information. Like you have information to understand which resolver you are missing uh, so that you can fetch it online and add it to your node. One of the things that we are exploring, which is really exciting by the way, um, is like, creating these resolvers in a language that can compile to WebAssembly. And so we talk a lot about like writing these resolvers in Rust and compiling them to WebAssembly because WebAssembly can then be fetched from the network itself. So if you find that you are trying to resolve through Ethereum, but you don't have the Ethereum resolver, you can fetch WebAssembly, inject into the WebAssembly VM that you are running, and suddenly your node gets a new superpower. Uh, and because you are fetching code that gets authenticated because of IPFS, right? Like you're fetching through an hash, uh, and because it gets isolated on the WebAssembly VM, it's kind of like, okay, don't quote me on this, but it's kind of safe to run it. <laughs> Definitely make make tests, uh, and <laughs> but 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 it's a pretty cool idea um, that you can just find computation online that solves your problem, that gives you the ability to understand data and just load it on the fly. So Matt, do you have a, a hand up? Just back out of like you threw in this notion of resolvers without defining a resolver. So to Rob's question, if I have an IPFS node that's storing some Ethereum transactions, but it does not have the resolver that knows how to make sense, how, knows how to resolve selectors within Ethereum content, that node would still be able to give you the, the content. It's still an IPFS node that has the content, but you would not be able to use IPLD selectors to say, hey, just give me this little piece within it of like, give me the, the, the sender's wallet address from, from this Ethereum transaction. And so that part, you would need an IPFS node that has a resolver that speaks Ethereum like that knows how to parse an Ethereum, the, the Ethereum data format. And so that's where different nodes will have different resolvers. And then part of the work is making it so that you could even dynamically load a resolver if you don't have it. So Matt, while you have the floor, do you mind uh, suggesting to others that might be watching the recording and so forth, some further resources to follow up on this? Well, what would you recommend? Uh, it's more that the, the documentation around this is still coming into existence. And so I'm more, uh, I'm wondering which, what should be the 
focus, uh, if we made a couple tutorials around IPLD, what should those tutorials show? My inclination is to have one tutorial that shows you just round tripping some JSON through DAG Seabor. So I have some I have some metadata that's maybe pointing to a Git data set and an Ethereum transaction, and I write that into IPFS, and I'm able to use that information and load it back out and use the resolvers. So maybe a, t a tutorial that shows that, but also um, something that's even simpler of I want to create some metadata about a file I just added to IPFS. So. I express that metadata as JSON and I persist it into IPFS and it gets persisted as as IPLD so that I could then use use that use resolvers to, to read the info. Those are the two tutorials that I lean towards um, that we should probably make around this because I that's like scratching the surface of what IPLD is. And honestly, I think when you go deeper than scratching the surface, it just confuses people. Like the, the doc, there is documentation out there that goes deeper, but it, it's just confusing people that far because there's just too much there conceptually. Yeah. Awesome. So we are going to, I do intend to end this at uh, 1030 unless people want to extend it. Um, and I noticed that there are about 10 or 11 people that have put their names in the notes and there are nine, 18 on the call. So if you haven't added your name to the notes, please do so. Um, any, any other topics or uh, do we want to continue this conversation for another five minutes? Uh, I, ju I just wanted to point Go out ahead, to some links. Um, so I, I posted here on the chat the interface IPLD format, which is basically the interface that like modules have to implement to add a new format, add a new super power, power to the IPLD resolver. Uh, you can check just IPLD. Uh, which as well, it's it's where all these other formats get plugged in, and like there's a bunch of tests of like creating nodes and like going through the nodes and doing traverse traversal on the nodes. Uh, if you check just IPFS itself, um, because all of this just IPLD API gets exposed on IPFS when on the DAG API, so it's it's like one on one mapping. Uh, on JSAPFS itself, you have an examples folder. On any examples folder, you have two examples. One is traversing IPLD graphs, and it shows you how to create DAG for above nodes and DAG CBOR nodes and like to traverse from one to the other. Um, and then there is also an example of like exploring the Ethereum blockchain, where there's like a, a bunch of Ethereum blocks there that you can just add with a block put, and then you can traverse through those and like get some data from those blocks. So it gives you like a an idea, like a, an example that you can test and see how it feels. Um, then there's like two tools. Um, one is the graph builder, which is like just like a, a thing that helps you build like large graphs with JSON. And then instead of like you having to create node by node and like tessellating them together by pointing by updating the link to the other one, you can just create like a, a large JSON structure and then say where to slice it. And then like it knows that like okay, I need to slice the, the JSON structure here um, and and replace the, the CID of this slice to that location so that it creates then the, the proper graph. There is also the UnixFS engine, and the UnixFS engine is the module that uh, knows how to convert files, chunk them, and create the graphs. And there is multiple layouts, multiple topologies of how those graphs get created. It's a little bit more complex module, but like if you have time to dive into, the, uh, into it, you will see how these graphs get created and how these things get used uh, and yeah, like this is the module that gives all of the add, cat, get APIs to just IPFS. So a lot of great insights there. Again, like it would be great if this was all a tutorial, um, but, but yeah, like we, we have a hybrid between examples, some explanations, some spec, and some code that might help people understand. The other point I, I really want to make, again, this is like level one. Like this is just like getting IPFS to be able to be this Merkle forest where all of the Merkle trees can live and all of the Merkle trees can be found and you can traverse through them from like you can jump from one tree to another tree. Um, there is other two layers and, and that is when we talk about selectors where instead of like you just picking a property of a graph, you can actually pick like an entire section of a graph. And then there is another thing which we typically call transformations, but transformations might be also known by graph theorists as processing, graph processing, or uh, as people from databases as um, query language. Uh, 
And so that is where uh, we talk about, okay, now that we have a graph database in IPFS, uh, how can we expose a really nice language that users can then interact with this, this immense forest of data? Um, we don't have a... Uh, sorry, someone spoke, but I... Sorry for interrupting. It would be awesome if you could just use GraphQL to like query everything. I think like it would be awesome to be able to use GraphQL, Noise, and other like graph engines on top of IPFS, and like just just have IPFS as like a storage engine for them, uh, and later like improve those the graph databases to understand what is Ashlinks, so that they can get the benefits for their searches and for their queries and so on. But yeah, totally agree. We should get GraphQL as a as a, a prototype. Cool, awesome stuff. So thank you, David. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank, thank you, you, Wyatt. And I would just like to say that, uh, you know, I've watched some of uh, Pedro's tutorials. I think they're awesome. I've watched some of uh, Victor's um, sessions, and I think those are very, very helpful as well. So um, let's see. I, I count about 14 or 15 names on the attendance list and the notes. I see about 18 participants, so please add your name if you haven't done so already. There was a comment to please add all the links that David posted in the chat into the notes, and I think that would be really, really helpful. So we are at um, 30 minutes after the hour, according to my clock. Are there any other topics, anything anyone would like to say? Before we wrap it up, we are trying to keep these to 30 minutes. Just to clarify, if you don't want to put yourself in the attendees list, you don't have to. That's totally optional. Good point. Thank you. All right. So thank you for allowing me to moderate. That's been fun. And uh, we will conclude the meeting then. Unless there's anything else that I'm missing, Matt. Uh, no, nope. thank you. We good? Alrighty. Okay, cool. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.